me your, uh, your ventriloquist, is that right? Yeah. And do you know what a ventriloquist is? Yes, somebody who wants to do a double act but's too mean to employ a partner. It goes back a long way. There was a uh, people called necromancers, and from necro meaning dead, they uh, made money by not only reading fortunes, but letting you speak to a dear departed person, of course, and they were just throwing their voice in. And uh, they were a little, a little shady. They would talk to, to people that weren't there, people that were in the basement shoveling coal, or people, I was gonna say, people on the telephone, but that was a more modern invention. And uh, they would, in a fish market, they would make the fish talk, you buy me, and all that sort of thing, you know. And it was, it was harmless fun more than anything else. There's a, a wonderful book uh, written in 1772 called Le Angostromy, another, that's the Greek word for ventriloquy. Uh, and it was a, a pseudo-scientific investigation by a, a gentleman named Abbe de la Chapelle. Uh, they sent him out uh, from Paris to see whether uh, ventriloquists were uh, in league with the devil, whether they had familiar spirits and whether they should be persecuted and perhaps burned at the stake or guillotined or whatever. And thankfully for the rest of us, he came to the conclusion that they, they were nothing to be, they're no more dangerous than magicians and mountebanks and, and street entertainers. So thank you, De La Chapelle, for getting us off the hook. <laughs> but it wasn't until a British ventriloquist by the name of Fred Russell who started using what we now know as a conventional thing with, it, with a, a ventriloquist that walks out and has a doll and puts him on his lap. In, Brit in Britain, they call them dolls, which drives me crazy, but anyway. Uh, and he had just one figure. It was called uh, Coster Joe. And uh, so that sort of became the, uh, uh, the model after which most modern ventriloquists uh, you know, aspire. And he worked till he was 93 years old. Uh, you drink the wine and at the same time make me say a continuous noise like this. Mm. You want it? All right, let's go. Mm. They were all over the place in vaudeville. I mean, every every bill practically had a ventriloquist. You know, you could make a, a decent a decent living in vaudeville. The obvious one is Edgar Bergen. He started in, in uh, Chautauqua when he was about 18 years old. And uh, he acquired uh, Charlie McCarthy in uh, 1922, who was originally a little Irish newspaper boy. Colonel Ware, I do not intend to rest on my laurels, but I intend to make some suggestions for improvements around here, huh? Chase and Sanborn or NBC, I don't know which, uh, came to him and asked if he wanted his own show. And uh, they brought him out here. And uh, he had the number one radio show for like 10, 12 years. It became almost too popular. Uh, there were Charlie McCarthy dolls and Charlie McCarthy everything. And then, of course, he made a film with uh, W.C. Fields, You Can't Cheat an Honest Man, and became even more famous. Uh, actually, he went on to do something like 12 films. There were imitators, and every magician, all of a sudden, also did ventriloquism in his act, you know. We hope you'll stop and look over Michigan's big new line, and that you'll stop and talk with the gentleman with the white coat. Are they after us again? Uh, no, it's a different kind of a white coat. This is the white coat with the red Clark in the back. There is some validity to this schizophrenia thing, and I will try to explain it to you. Every professional ventriloquist at one time or another has experienced this on stage. Because it, basically you're doing a two-man two stand-up comedy act. Part of your brain is doing the ventriloquist, part of your brain is doing the figure. And if you get on a, a roll, in other words, you're really cooking, you know. Occasionally, only occasionally, the figure, dummy, doll, whatever, will say something that you have not heard before. So the you ventriloquist part will react to it as though you're a part of the audience, and you will laugh. And it's a strange feeling, you know. Uh, I discussed this with a, a famous uh, psychiatrist once, and he said, well, it's not dangerous, but it is called spontaneous schizophrenia. What is your name? Joseph. 
know the name. It's still Jim. It's J-I-M, you know, sir. I've heard people tell me many a time, how's your father? How is your father? All right. Then from now on, your name is James Howe. Arthur Prince, uh, a British uh, ventriloquist, wanted to be buried with his figure. And uh, at the last minute, some health authority in, in London said, you can't do it, well, it's against the law. And so, according to his son, uh, when everybody had left, it was just the immediate family, they did take the figure's head and place it in the coffin. So we can only assume that it's still there. I'd like to have thrown a brick at you. What do you mean? I mean that you weren't trying. What do you mean? I, you were not trying. You wouldn't do as I told you. I told you to keep away from this man. I couldn't get away from him. You wouldn't let me get away from him. The first ventriloquist I saw, I was 10 years old, and it was in a vaudeville show in Chicago. And I sat there, and after the Andrew sisters had finished singing rum and Coca-Cola, which didn't thrill a 10-year-old boy, out came this guy with a doll, and a figure, and it spoke. And I said, that's what I want to do. I had been doing magic up until then, trying to fool my friends and not being very successful at it. And I went to the Chicago Public Library the next day and went through the card file, and there was like seven books on ventriloquism, and five of them had disappeared. <laughs> and the two that I was able to bring home were, one was written in 18-something or other, and it was just nonsense, mumbo-jumbo. And the other one was, was pretty good, and I... Uh, uh, taught myself from that. Incidentally, all professional ventriloquists that I have known, and I've known a lot of them, had only two things in common. They were all self-taught, autodidactic, big long word, and they all learned it before puberty, before the change of voice, and there are no exceptions, none. Dudley was created and conceived for uh, a television show, which was going to be a sitcom uh, to star the late Bill Bixby, and unfortunately, it, one of those showbiz stories, it never got on the air, but I, I ended up with the fruits of that labor as, as, as my main figure, and uh, he's interesting. It took uh, two years to make him, and he does lots of different things, as perhaps we will see later, and uh, and was supposed to star originally in, in, uh, in Magic as, uh, as Fats. Didn't quite happen, though. You really think you're that good, do you? I'll get him fucking see you, I am. It had, it had been a long time, really, since there had been a, a major motion picture devoted to the subject matter of ventriloquism. Ironically, our film is called Magic, but it's, nonetheless, it's, it's uh, mostly involves ventriloquism. Lon Chaney played a ventriloquist in, in uh, two separate films of the same title, The Unholy Three. The first one was a silent film, and the last one was a talkie. And uh, ironically, uh, it was his last film because while he was making this film about a ventriloquist, he was also dying from throat cancer. So there was a, a huge irony there. Eric von Stroheim, uh, played The Great Gabo, uh, which was his next to last film. And it's from a short story by Ben Hecht. And uh, it's about a ventriloquist who goes stark raving mad, of course. I suppose we've all seen uh, Dead of Night with Sir Michael Redgrave. And that was a black and white picture directed by Cabo Conti, uh, I think right after the war in England. And it's six stories uh, stuck together. And the last one, which is the one that, the only one that anyone remembers, is about the, uh, the ventriloquist uh, and his figure. And it was, it went over the edge. It was sort of a Twilight Zone type of thing.